Today, I'm going to take you through a little journey about uh, creating realistic rocks and water on your model railroad. And just like when we look at all aspects of our hobby, including uh, the locomotives and rolling stock and track and stuff, for the most part, we get started by going out and looking at the real thing. And it's no different when it comes to scenery. To focus on scenery and specifically how it relates to uh, rock and water, it may be something new to you, maybe something that you do on a regular basis. But when I started doing this, I, every time now, now when I look at a scene, either in a video, a photograph, or on a travel trip somewhere, I start seeing aspects of what I'm observing and how it applies to my model rail running. So I'm trying to, at the beginning here, is help you have a look at, I guess you could say this whole process uh, by taking that kind of approach. So what I'm going to do is I'm just first of all going to uh, get myself a laser pointer here to make it easier for you to see things. Um, just taking any picture at all, you can see this is an ocean side scene that includes rocks and water. But there's things that you can tell just by observing the scene that you can apply to your modeling every day. One of the thing is, is how color changes from the water's perspective from a dark blue into a greenish color towards white as it comes to shore. Also, you can see differences in texture from the types of waves on a stormy day to it smoothing out as it comes around the point and into the shore. Also too, when you see the, uh, where it joins the land, um, there's a lot happening in terms of your sand being wet and also uh, debris from uh, weeds and that sort of thing uh, that get washed up on the shore. If you look at it from the rocks perspective, you can see that there's a tide line and it's much darker, almost black towards the bottom and that the rocky cliffs are generally speaking on a 30 degree angle, which is the normal wear and tear that rocks experience in the world. Uh, when you get jagged cliffs breaking away, it's a rather unique situation, but typically erosion will be on about a 30 to 35 degree <laughs> angle. Also, too, you can see here that the rocks is an infill to protect the road along the shore. The other factor as you move inland is you start to see greenery and you see all kinds of things happening with fencing to differentiate depth in the scene. So you go from a foreground grass to having a fence, to having some water, to having some rock, to having some fence, to have some road, and then eventually the lighthouse on the hill. Every time you create a dimensional line like this in your modeling, you're going to create depth in your scene. Now, when we study the real thing, we're going to look at a number of different factors. One is, uh, you know, what, what kind of scenery are we producing on our model railroad? Is it a mountain? Is it uh, a very calm valley type scene? What time of year is it going to be? Is it going to be where the water's rushing through just after a rainstorm? Um, is the water going to be high as it goes under your bridge? Typically, we like to do bridges on our railroad. Um, how easy is it going to be to see the bottom? And what color tones do you see in the water? Are there going to be rapids? Um, how narrow, how wide is this going to be? And how much of the reflective colors of the scenery around it affecting the actual color tone in the water? Now here's Dick Elwell's stone and water. And you can see an element I want you to think about when you're modeling here is that there's some continuity between the colors that you see in the rocks and the colors within the water and also the colors within this structure that he has. And there's a common element of, I would call it railroad buff over gray kind of tones. I don't know if you recognize it, but it's there. And what this continuity does really helps everything from the stonework you see here to the rock formations. In addition, he's got some vertical height. I took this picture from the floor angled upwards and you can see that rocks can be used in this context to create a very big fast drop of more than 30 degrees and you, of course you're getting a waterfall there. It gives you a chance to do falls but also to have some flat surfaces and maybe uh, some dams up above. Now what we have to be cautious of when we're uh, modeling and what we see in reality is we got to think of scale. 
The picture on the left shows you definitely water crashing on the shore, but if you did this on your model railroad, it would just overdo the scene and take away from everything you're trying to accomplish on the layout. So you have to be considered of the fact that there are things like distances between waves, how high the waves are going to crash. Is it just going to be ripples like you see in here? Um, all these kinds of decisions need to be thought about and observed and see how they are affected in, in the modeling you're eventually going to do. Also to use, notice that there's a color tone here that's in the grays. And, the, and is that what your model railroad is having or is it much more green? Uh, is it brown? What is it that you're thinking about when you look at your whole railroad and how water and rock is going to fit into it? The other factor that you should look at in, in terms of dealing with water is the tones. And you can see in this particular case, there's definitely a bluish green impact here. But more importantly, look at the relationship between that and the details of the colors that are used in doing this buoy and the blue heron. Now, also, that gives you a great idea. You take a photo. This is a painting that's done by Trolls Kirk. But if you see a photo like that, you may want to say, hmm, uh, maybe I, I should uh, uh, try to find a, a scale bird and stick it on top of something that I can create, scratch build, and stick it in my water. To put this in the foreground will create extra depth in the water scene that you have in behind it and add interest. Now, the other thing is you have to think about the time of year. In this particular case here, we're dealing with summer. And so the water levels are low. So when you look across at the bridge here, you can see that there's some components of where the, the, uh, the abutments are actually going into the dirt and rock ground below. The other factor is, is that when the water's high around here, you're gonna see lots of water rushing through and smoothing the tops of all these stones. But as you get towards the summer, you will see that these are being more and more exposed. In addition to that, you'll see the rock work along the shoreline will also become exposed and they'll all have that sort of smooth round factor. The other thing is, is what time of day are you having on your layout? Is it going to be bright and sunny with the light overhead? Or if it starts to become towards the end of day, you might find that your watercolor tones should be darker uh, than normal. The other factor too that comes into play when we do our bridge work a lot of times is that we try to create these 75 degree slopes and a little puddle that kind of wiggles through our layout so that we can maximize um, our scenery on the shore. But we should be also thinking about modeling water in the scale it should be modeled. So really a lot of times when you see bridges going across streams, there are shorelines that'll stretch back maybe another girder bridge um, and or grassy slopes at a 30 degree angle. Now this shot here shows uh, water uh, roaring down a river. And this is something if you're looking at essing your water into the background, where do the rapids occur and where do the flat smooth places happen? You can see in front of the bridge and the water's going from left to right here. Uh, that there's a lot of rocks in the water here and that you get rapids that are burning over the top at a relatively low level of water. And there are a lot of exposure along the shore here. But once it gets past the bridge piers, it smooths out because all this is getting in the way of, of the main flow. And the rock and stone that normally comes down from the mountains doesn't end up past the bridge to any degree. But yet again, when you hit in the curve in the water, you can see that the white of the rapids start to pick up again. And these are all just ideas and thinking that you should be going through when you're looking at your photographs, your videos, or your experiences when you go out. And also too, even though this is in the mountains, you can see that leading up to your bridge, there's a lot of fill here, again, on those, uh, angles that are 35, 40 degrees, which are typically um, the kind of thing that you would see with erosion. So the gravel's put in there to prevent the erosion and its smoothness of uh, the water breaking away from the track. Now, the other factor is, is that you're going to get some uh, color effects in your water. It could be muddy brown. It could be green, like in this case here. What's contributing to the green? Well, there are a couple of things. There's, uh, there's the kinds of 
mineral materials that are in the water to start with, but also to the forest reflect in the water to give it this nice emerald tone, which is very unique in British Columbia. You can see here that the river over the years has declined away from where these bridge piers are, and you can see the same kind of stonework along the shoreway uh, that, that I had shown you previously. You can also see here where erosion has happened around the corner here and the, uh, the, uh, the uh, land is broken away in the curve of the river. And you can model this as well as open dirt and sand. Now, the other factor when you get into the details of your modeling really, really close, are you dealing with a rather calm environment where you'll see lots of uh, greenery starting to grow up around the smooth rocks along the shoreway? Or are you going to have a rough sea where a, a lot of mud and gunk and uh, seaweed rots on, on the smooth stonework that you see here? And you can see the tide line. And uh, so it, it creates a completely different scene. So look at your railroad, look at your scenery, and look at the kind of water there, and then try to duplicate it. Uh, this one up here is uh, sort of a Bernard Halen Canadian favorite here. The, Canada goose on the rock. But again, it's nice to see this three-dimensional concept on your modeling in the foreground, something to look at, the birds. And then just out in the water here, you see a nice little uh, uh, pier with a light on it to protect against the rock formation that's there. And then off into the distance, you might want to put a ship or a boat um, to give it some depth. And then your scenery is all in the background is almost uh, negligible. Reflections are another thing. Uh, sometimes people like to do uh, reflective water. And as a consequence, uh, you can see here that with a, if you're going to have a ripply type of uh, waterway, the uh, reflections will get broken up, where if it's smoother, uh, the reflections will be clearer. In addition, color will affect reflections. I've even seen in the fall where you'll see bright reds and oranges and and colors like that and reflected in the water that uh, below. So if you're doing this kind of rock scenery, you can see the impact that all this has on the color tones that you're, you're viewing in the water. Here you can see a rippled area and a smooth area. And you may want to model that where you're having wind uh, factors that occur in the foreground and then goes into a glossy smoothness. The glossy smoothness, the angle of the sun makes this part darker. And also, too, you can see reflections here, where here you can barely see reflections because of the ripples. Now, let's talk rock. Let's get into modeling stuff. I think it's enough of the, uh, the background there. Now, when we see rock and we model rock, we have so many different ways that we can create it today. Um, some of the examples I have here is you can use some dental plaster and you can use sculpt a mold. You can carve foam, you can use polyfill, you can use real stock uh, stones and rock, gravel. Whatever you, you've got in hand, you can generate an amalgamation of different textures all in the same space. The difficulty we have when we do this kind of thing and whether we carve it or uh, you know, we, we mold it on using rock molds or fill in uh, with a spatula, is that every one of these takes stains differently. So the approach that I'm going to talk about a little bit today or with you today is using acrylic paint starting from dark to light so that you can take all of these different mediums and create the same color effects uh, so that the transitions that you see between one and the next are seamless. Now this is Trolls Kirk's Teal light model. And what he did is well, after he built the structure, he placed it within his uh, rock work and started to mold around it to create a realistic view. And you can see here, even in these slopes, which are rigid and right at the, at the water's edge, the angles are, are fairly uh, shallow towards the water. There's different mediums used here. He's used plaster um, and, and he's carved it. And you can see that in the watered area that the rocks are smoother and rounder. And where a shore, where there's erosion, uh, where the water is crashing up from the waves, they're That's much cool. more um, uh, rigid or cracked and, and broken away. 
Now, when you're painting with acrylic, you want to create a warm yes. black color rather than a cold black. And what is warm black? Well, basically what that is, is mixing a brown within your paint color. So in this particular case, we're dealing with Mars black and a very, very, very deep tone of uh, raw umber. The mixture can be to your choice, but you can see what it's done is it's right. created an interesting black uh, that's not um, in shock. your face. I'm sorry, there's somebody talking over there. Anyway, uh huh. In addition, you gotta watch the the, the markers. If we could have everybody mute your mics, except for uh, Chris, please. Okay, so yeah. even in the context of the watercolor here. It started with black and you've both had added ultramarine blue, but that black that Ooh. was used here is the same black that was used in the land. So what yes. you're dealing with is still having that brown introduced into the color so that now there is a tone that's consistent between the water and the rock that you see here on the land. As you move into shore, you see yeah. some greens are starting to be added to the water and eventually uh, some Naples yellow in as you get closer to the shore. And what the this does yeah. is create tonal differences um, and wave patterns that you can paint on and look at the distances between mm. your wave shapes like before you actually apply today. your... Um, your finishes well it was uh, it was uh, it was on the perimeter area of, of that they have isolation they have sort of like the grounds around the courthouse or one one grand can you mute your mic a please false barrier to keep everybody away from the courthouse directly and this guy was on the edge of that and he's originally out of florida and he's, what, he's a total conspiracy wing nut can and, you uh, mute him from there peter yeah uh, eric oh, there he goes him? okay oh, there we go it. so anyway you can, I, I hopefully everybody can see that the brown has made a tonal quality across the whole color scape of the acrylic paint from the ocean into the shore. And this can be applied also if you're dealing with lakes or streams uh, or rivers. Now, you can see when you start to add lighter tones and dry brush your rock using the same kind of brown in the background and adding lighter shades of of beiges and uh, other colors, which I'll show you later, the tonal quality between the water and the rock remains the same. So starting with the black finish, it allows all your shadows and all your over top of all of your different uh, mediums that you use to create rock, a consistency that you can work with. You can start to paint up using uh, either dry brushing techniques or, or watery glazes of color over top of those tones to generate the different things that you see in the color here. So that eventually, if you're going to apply some gloss um, over top of your water, you can start to add things in along the shoreline like your weeds um, and, and other stones and small material. Now, some of this pebbling that you see in here, you could use plaster bits, but you could also use uh, real limestone, rock, and gravel, whatever gives you the proper shape that you need. You can also see waterline colors here where the tide comes up. So all of these things can be created now starting by following this process. The other thing is, is that you can notice that he used the same stonal, stonal qualities in the styrofoam stones, and this is a nose scale, um, to, to generate the same kind of grayish black colors that are consistent, uh, very similar to what we saw with Dick Elwell, where the rock and the colors that are used within the structure are very much the same. Now, this is uh, Trolls Kirk. He's a, a watercolor artist and acrylic artist. He's world renowned. He's won a lot of prizes in Europe. He created an ON30 model railroad that is to just die for. It's sold now. But if you want to learn about what he does with water, you can use this website here um, as an access point. But also you can just type, type into YouTube, Trolls Kirk Water, and you will see his uh, online clinic and demonstration of what I'm going to show you next. 
So the idea here is that you're going to be using gloss mediums, acrylic mediums, which you can get at any Michael's store that come in different viscosities. They can start with a very liquidy varnish and make their way up through a, a standard gloss medium to a heavy gel to something very, very heavy, which they call a, a super ultra heavy gel, which will stand on end and can be shaped in any form. Now, when it goes on, it looks like this white colored, um, I don't know, cream or whatever, but when it dries, it dries perfectly clear. You can also see here that it can be used to create wet effects within the, the, uh, the uh, uh, weeds and stuff that, that come up on the, on the shore and the seaweed. So at the end of the day, what he, what he does after he applies the different levels and he works it, if you follow, the, uh, and he uses a palette knife to apply these, you can see in O scale here that there's only really three big waves between the edge of his layout and the rocks. So be very conscious of the, it didn't leave space between your waves. Don't try to uh, make a whole bunch of them really close together because it won't look in scale. The other factor is he's angled them in at a certain 45 degree angle towards the shoreline. And it makes it much more realistic and allows the, the shaping as it goes around the landforms and gives you a better eye of interest of the direction of the ocean from where it is coming in and hitting the shore. Now, using your fingers, what he does is after this stuff dries, he applies white along the top here, some titanium white paint, and he draws it back with his finger's edge, and it creates these backsplashes in the waves. So if you're interested in ocean type uh, scenery with uh, really heavy waves, it's something you may wanna consider. Now, so let's get started. What I'd like you to think about now is, is the learning process. One of the things is, is a lot of people say, well, gee, you know, that's all very nice, but I'm kind of afraid to do that. Or if you had done it, you've never really tried these particular products or whatever. So what I suggest is you get a small chunk of plywood. I think this one's about maybe 10 inches square or something like that. Slap down a uh, plaster mold, maybe different mediums. Uh, try some sculpt mold, uh, cellular clay, whatever you have to create uh, joints in your uh, rock formations, even generate your waves so you don't have to use a lot of the acrylic uh, gel. And, and I put them purposely close together here because this was to a learning process. I wanted lots of opportunity to create waves and, and shape the backsides of them. Towards the shore, they're sharp down and they angle back uh, as you're out towards the ocean or in this direction. Um, I also put some holes in there so I could put some puddles in. I even left some of the plywood bare to see what would happen when I started to paint it. Now, considering the paints, um, for the rock work, there's black, there's white, so that'll give you the uh, you know light to dark uh, quality. But also too, I wanted to show you there's a difference in, in the umber colors. Now the raw umber color is actually the dark brown, so don't get confused by that. When you get burnt umber, you will start to see some reddish tones come into it. So what you really want to do when you're working with your rock, if you don't want to have the reddish effect in it too strong, is you want to make sure you're using raw umber. You can use burnt sienna if you want to have a reddish sienna highlight later on, and may even go as far as red oxide and Naples yellow. And just like what we do when we highlight our structures and stuff like that, don't forget to have some light flesh around to a final highlight color when you're dry brushing on your rock. These are all artists' acrylics. They're all applied with these big bushy uh, brushes. You can get them at art supply stores. It doesn't really matter what brand. I've got a number of different brands here that you can see. Uh, there's Liquitex, there's uh, Pabio, and they can be studio brand acrylics or they can be professional acrylics. It doesn't really matter. Golden is another brand. They're all available out there and they're relatively cheap by the big tube. When we're painting with this stuff, I don't water it down at all. The only watering that I might do is I might spritz my palette 
uh, once in a while just to keep the paint moist. Here's an example of the palette I use, these tearaway palettes, because when I'm done, I can just roll it up, peel it off, and throw it away. But here, with this, you should try to keep your paint loose. You don't want to overmix it to get a single color. So over here, we started with the black, and then we added some blue. There's the brown that I added to it to give it that brownish color. Then over here, what I did was I took some of this and added it to the blue. And then I added some green in, into, the, into the water mix. Now you can use a forest green or a dark green or a standard uh, deep green, whatever you have to generate uh, a, a, a color lightness difference between the blue and, and eventually getting closer to shore. And over here we have Naples yellow and you can see the effect that it has. It creates these kind of interesting grayish tones which are really nice in terms of matching up with what you actually find uh, in your rock work on the shore. Now you can even do streams like this and you just paint right over your rocks, okay? Whether you're using real stone or you're using uh, plaster or just a straight wooden bottom. So whatever color you applied is the kind of quality that's gonna come up through the gloss medium. Now let's get back to that black tone. Okay, this is a separate piece. I did a clinic uh, with a whole bunch of people doing this, and this might be something you might want to try uh, at one of your get-togethers where, you, you know, everybody comes in with a plaster casting and some acrylic paint and a chunk of plywood, and you glue them down and you, and you paint it black, all right, just like the song. Now, as you start to add the color tones, I'll just show you some of this. This is the brownish black that we had. Here is the color tone of the black, brown, and blue. Here it is with some green mixed into it. And you can see that I've altered the backside and the tops of the waves with a lighter green color. But as I got into shore here, I started applying the green uh, to create a shallower look. And I've applied some up in here in the rocks where I wanted a puddle. And look at here where the, I added some yellow. And it's really getting shallow in there. There must be some rock pretty close to the surface there. Hmm. So now, as you're applying, use lighter colors for the tops of the waves in the shallow areas. And this is just another viewpoint of what it looks like after it's dried. Now, you can start to dry brush your rocks going from dark to, to light. You, you can pick the tone colors you want, but in this particular case, I, I, I went with the, uh, the reddish uh, uh, colors of the, the sienna and then moved towards flesh tone and white. And so you, this, it doesn't really matter what approach you take here or what tone. This is all an experiment about learning how to go from dark to light on acrylic and creating these uh, interesting uh, tonal qualities just by scrubbing in uh, uh, a dry brush paint, which we are all quite familiar with. Now there's a kind of a close-up look as to what it really looks like. You can actually see uh, some of the ply, bare plywood down here and over here and some of the plaster, it doesn't really matter. Uh, what we're trying to do here is practice the technique of rock tones and water tones. Now, the Liquitex heavy gel medium, super heavy gel medium, you can get that at Michael's. I recommend a coupon, a little goes a long way. So here I uh, applied it over top of all the water and I used uh, just a squirrel round brush and crunched it in initially. And then I started to work with a palette knife, scraping it up on my preformed waves that I made with the uh, plaster earlier. And I really wanted to see what I could do uh, with the splashing up technique. So I really went overboard. And again, because this is practice, I just wanted to learn uh, how to make splashing waves against the rocks and create a kind of a realistic waveform. It looks uh, like somebody just put uh, white uh, cream over top of everything, but it, it'll dry perfectly clear. Now, the thicker you apply this stuff, the longer it takes to dry. And sometimes if you apply it too thick, what'll happen is it'll take weeks before it all dries. 
So I recommend if you're going to use it, just use thin layers. Um, and then once it dries, if you want more, add more later, because you can just keep adding as much as you want uh, to create whatever form you want. Here's what it looks like close up. Um, you can tease it. I used a palette knife to tease mine. I used uh, skewer sticks, whatever I could to generate all these funny little ends. If it, some of them look kind of stringy, you can trim them off with scissors after it dries. But anyway, that's what it kind of looks like. And it comes out really, you can use a trowel to push it up uh, just to make it interesting. So after it dries, this is what it looks like. And you can see what happens where it's thicker. It's still white. But over here where it has dried, it started to go really nice and glossy and clear. And what you get is the water effect. And you can see the light and the dark of the wave lines. Now on your model railroad, you're going to have much more space between these waves if you so choose. Or you may not have any waves at all. So this whole process wouldn't necessarily uh, be required. You could just either stipple it on or, or use a lighter gloss medium rather than that super heavy gel. Uh, just use a standard gloss gel and it'll, it'll be a much, much smoother process. I also like using this in small streams and when I want to really have it running over my rocks so that I can later go in and apply um, different things to create uh, rapids going down on a small stream. The nice thing about this product is that it doesn't wick. You have perfect control over it. Um, you, it it's not going to run under your layout and onto the floor. Um, I have nothing against uh, the use of the two-part epoxies. In fact, you can, you, if you want, you can use two-part epoxy. And if you're not happy with what's finished, you can go right over top uh, with this acrylic paste over top of your epoxy uh, to clean up and fix whatever you're not happy with. Here's a close-up of what it looks like when it's still drying versus when it dries perfectly clear and you can see how glossy it is. You can dry brush the tips now with a little bit of white. Uh, Trolls Kirk, he recommends that you don't overdo this process, that you should use that sparingly because uh, waves don't crash everywhere. Uh, though they did here, you can see over here that that's not the case. There's still a lot of open space here. The other thing that's really nice about this material is, is if you decide you want to go to bed and you stopped here, you can come back the next day and you can do this, uh, the rest of the water later and integrate it into what you have and it'll be completely seamless. And that's shown in the video in the movie, a movement uh, in the movie as well. I think that's interesting to note that if you are going to use a palette knife, you can create waves just by dragging it like this and rocking it back and forth uh, in that motion. And he shows that in the video quite nicely. Um, here's some example using the same technique where, in fact, he didn't uh, really want white caps. This is in a, in, a, in a sheltered area near the shoreline, but he's uh, picked and, and chose colors where they're darker because of the, all the shadowing that happens in and around here and even so under his bridge. And uh, you can see that you can do tonal qualities between the dark areas and light areas. You can actually paint them in as versus relying on the lights in your room. Now, there are many other ways you can uh, make water. I think this is glass over some particular acrylic that's probably in one of uh, the model railroads that uh, is quite famous in terms of the ore docks and so on and so forth. And this one here is an example of some detailing that you can get using the acrylic technique um, right around the shore. What I really like about this picture is that the uh, it's blurred a bit here, but this is the diorama. This is the real ocean. So you, you can do stuff like this and get matches that you can be completely happy with. The other factor about the, gla the gloss that I really like, it has wonderful reflective qualities so that if you're going to have night scenes and you're going to light your structures, uh, you're going to get these beautiful reflections in your, in your nighttime scenery. Here's a farther back picture of that scene. You can see there's the real ocean, there's the water, 
and and the trying to match the colors and the application of acrylic. So you can even look at this uh, diorama here where you start to see a much muddier grayish tone that's been done. And that's because when you look at the shore and the models that are there, he was trying to create a color tone that was very similar and matched what he did in his modeling. Now, when you look at this tone, you might say, well, where's the blue and stuff like that? Well, maybe you want to stay away from that. Maybe you want to work towards uh, blacks and grays and then maybe adding uh, some tan color into it, a buff or something like that to create the color tone that you want in this and use that as well in your rock work. So that again, there's that continuity between the structures, the water and the rock. Water is wonderful to work with. You can have lots of these fun little scenes that you can put in place that just add, add to the scenery. Look at, and then you can have a completely calm and, 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 and wonderfully uh, gloss finished in this model. You can see here that there's tide lines, there's uh, the brownish colors and brackishness that you typically get that stains the wood from the seaweed, seaweed on your rock work. And it just creates such a realistic look when you're, when you're modeling. Now, my first attempt, and that's where we all start somewhere, right? So uh, way back in uh, when I was in Ottawa, I wanted to create water on my layout. So I went out and got some acrylic gloss medium. And all I tried using the colors and different things like that. But I don't know. I just had, wasn't at that spot in my learning. So I used the blackish brown. And I painted the whole thing the same color. And then I applied the, the gloss medium over the top with my palette knife and created little ripples, no big waves or anything like that. And I put it in in front of everything in my scenery. And what I did here by putting this waterway in here, there was a couple of things that happened. It pushed my layout back towards the wall and create depth in the scene. The other thing it did is I used smaller, almost N scale sized trees in front of it here, which gave it sort of a reversed force perspective so that it looked like this lake is much bigger than it actually was. Now, if I went and put an HO scale a boat or a, a canoe in there, it would destroy that complete effect. Even the island I made look make it made it look smaller. So in perspective of the painted backdrop that I have here, uh, the uh, models of the structures against the wall, the track work, and uh, the scenery in front of it, and the water created one, two, three, four, five, six layers of depth to the horizon line. The other thing, there's a practical thing here too. You can see all the switching in here. Well, the guys on the layout, then they came to operate. Those are all hand throw switches and they had to reach in. Now they got up on little stools, but they could actually lean on this black stuff here and it wouldn't affect it at all. And if they happen to have greasy hands, it didn't matter. I could just come in with a wet sponge and cloth later and wash it off. And all the dirt, dust, and grime goes away in one go, and it, it brings it right back to that nice finish again. Anyway, it was kind of fun. Um, I, I really recommend you give it, give it a go in that sense. Uh, here it is over here in a beaver pond where it was really shallow, and you could see the bottom. I used uh, a, a very... Um, non-viscous, uh, I guess you could say, gloss medium that would almost flow. Um, and I could push it up against the shoreline there and not worry about, and this goes into the beaver lodge and, and so on and so forth, and not really worry too much uh, about it wicking and that sort of thing. Um, all I did with the bottom is I put sticks and dirt and I spray painted some black in the darker areas. So again, I got that tonal quality from the light uh, into the brown and into the sort of the deeper black parts. And I also pushed that up in, into the beaver lodge and the dam. And eventually this is the kind of thing that you can end up with. And this is like four inches of space here between the track work and the wall. So again, you've got, you know, your mountains, you've got a second layer of scenery, third layer of scenery all painted on painted on trees, real trees, some 30 degree angle dirt, 
water, some foreground with some fencing and then the rail. And then in front of that, you've got a, a, my pond and all that other stuff. So more and more depth in a short space. Now, I worked on Greg Stubbing's project. He asked me to come over and, and, and do his railroad and he had a curve in the corner and he wanted to have a really strong wrap stream. He wanted it really dark. Uh, this was in the early stages. What you can see here is uh, some of the problems that you run into if you create too steep a slope. You end up with these little narrow pieces in the front widening out in, into the backdrop. And it presents uh, problems when you're trying to work the scene uh, properly towards the water. So you might be better off to have a, a much gentler angle down to your waterway. Now this was done with the same process of the, of the dark blues and greens uh, applied with the blackish brown uh, moving towards the yellow. Uh, the only thing that's different here is that when the final coats went on around the bridge here with the uh, dry brushing of the white water, I also added some furnace filter and, and put it in, or not furnace filter, uh, aquarium filter, or you can use cotton batten and put it in where it's frothing uh, around the bridge piers. I also tried to paint, I redid the painting on his bridge piers to have a closer match between uh, the rock color and the water and also in the weathering of the, of the bridge. These were all done with uh, modelers acrylics, uh, or I should say done with um, artists acrylics and a dry brushing technique. For, the, for all of that. And that was after I put the water in so I could get it all nicely matched color-wise. Now here's a little bit closer. You can see the cotton bat in here. In fact, there's a funny little squiggle there that we eventually had to work on and fix. But you, you, you can, when you put the gloss medium into the cotton bat and it soaks it, and you can use a skewer or whatever to manipulate it around so it looks like there's foam flowing underneath the, uh, the waterway itself from the rapids. This is a little farther back and you can see here the problem that we were running into with having a narrow waterway towards the front of the layout. Now there's lots you, you can do with that, I suppose. I would, if it was at this steep an angle because it's all dirt here, I may, would have considered maybe eventually putting rock work in there and then uh, reapplying some more acrylic to move it up against the shore. And this is the same problem here. Uh, and also be, be careful with your application of, uh, of straw and different uh, like brush pieces and that, that, that they're in scale. But the point I wanted to show in this picture really was, again, this is no different in terms of the process except there's a real stone bottom here. And I took the colors that I saw here along the shore and I dabbed it all over different, different shades, different colors over every little piece of rock all the way down uh, and, and mixed the colors, some greens in from the forest and just pushed it in to the bottom before I applied the acrylic and, and the uh, cotton batten. And then the acrylic layers went on top, created rapids, dry brushed the, the white water, et cetera. So there they are kind of side by side. You can use a scenic block. There's, there's two things I, I can say about water and rock on a layout. In this particular case, what you're seeing is the bridging aspect of water where it goes to the wall. So you, and, and the bridge goes across it. The other way is uh, typically uh, where you have maybe a, a, a fishing village or uh, some kind of pier work, and it's more on the horizontal plane where the water's in front and the rock is behind. So if you're going to go and do something like this, you want to create an S-curve, and what that does is, is it makes it a little more realistic in terms of how the water's flowing through us versus going straight through the backdrop. We we're still fiddling around with this part to try to figure out how we could curve it behind the, the hill there to, to make it look more realistic. Now here's a close up of that shallow water I was talking about using the acrylic. You can still see all the stones and, and the wood and whatever you're doing, just like if you applied, except there's a roughness about it. Now you've got these rapids and you've got the water crashing over. There's some speed, motion and movement 
and uh, you can do this with the uh, with a you know the material the aquarium fil fil uh, filter the gel and the barbecue stick now I, I did a diorama a number of years ago uh, where I applied again the same kind of techniques where I wanted to blend the colors of the water with the rock and the structure and it really does make it look more realistic when you can go and do something like that I started with the rock techniques no different there's cellular clay in there there's plaster castings uh, you know, there's molded plaster stonework. It's all plate painted that blackish brown color. Then what happened is as I dry brushed it up, I ended up with something like this with the lighter and lighter tones. And you can see here that uh, I, I also added some Bragdon powder to create some staining and some India ink, or in I think this case, it was salmon uh, wood stain that was a blackish brown that I used to stain the rock. I applied my foliage and then on top of that, I put stain to tone it down. And I also put some gloss medium eventually on it uh, to make it wet. And that's just a standard uh, use of uh, scenic express materials and woodland scenics foam. You can see down here at the bottom, there's the uh, painting of the water and the color differences as you move into the shores, it gets lighter and the wetness of this and the color tones of the rock and how they all fit together. And that's on a very, very small nine inch by 12 inch piece of wood. Now here's some of the examples here. You see here the gloss gel, that's gonna have, it won't stand on its own, it will start to settle. Um, so it's kind of good for doing uh, flatter surfaces, but this is the super heavy gel, which creates all these neat little waveforms and splash points around your, your pier post. And this is an HO scale. And you can also do ripples around the boat with the action of the, of the wind hitting the side of the boat and the waves, et cetera, and the dark and the light and the white caps and stuff like that. Okay, so another reference person I want to mention is a fellow named Boomer. You might have seen him on uh, YouTube. He has a channel. Uh, he, he does a, a, an awful lot of work with acrylics. He uses golden mediums for countless water, land, road, and foliage effects. And I would recommend that you have a look at his videos because he does the applications right there. And he, he again uses, uh, in his case, because the Fraser River that he is modeling, again, you go back to the original, it's it never seems very glossy and reflective. It's rather grainy, grainy brown color. So if that's what your plan is, what he's gone to using uh, a semi-gloss medium rather than a super gloss. So understanding all of these, these acrylic mediums gives you so much latitude in terms of the style and effect that you want to create with your water. You can put it over top of um, uh, tape and stuff like that if you want to create waterfalls. Uh, at the base of the falls, again, you can add the furnace filter and, you know, basically add the uh, the gels to it, et cetera, et cetera. So I'd recommend you have a look. This is uh, his uh, um, video specifically on dealing with the river and the shoreline, but he also talks about rocks on the shoreline and how he gets the tonal color effects and, and, and working sand. And he uses a lot of matte medium in his mixture. So if you're using real rock, or if you're using um, any kind of, um, e even in the context of your bottom of the river, if you're worried about stuff absorbing and what's seen underneath is gonna show through, he's, he, he will use um, matte medium and water, just like when you're putting down your uh, ballast uh, to cover all the rock and sand and, and, and stonework so that he can paint it. He paints everything, and that's what I've gone to uh, myself, and it gives you total control because what's the point? Even when you're going out and, you, and you're getting real dirt, and you're saying, oh, gosh, it's not the right color. Well, my gosh, there's nothing to that. Oh, if you want it the right color, all you have to do is seal it and paint it, okay? Your road work, anything, your water, and you become a, a three-dimensional artist. 
And there's nothing wrong with that. It, we all start someplace where we're not good at things, just like when we're doing our model railroading. So, you know, his his thing is practice and try it and keep going, because every time you do it, you're going to make mistakes and learn from them, and you're going to get better and better. And the nice thing about this is you can do them on little squares, and it's going to cost you basically next to nothing other than your time to learn. Now, creating realistic in water, it's something that's a learning process. I really encourage people to give this a try. There's lots of different ways and there's and there's nothing wrong with the other methods. They're all fine. They make beautiful work, but this is something that maybe you might want to give it a try on your railroad to get what you want. And now I'm ready for taking questions. All right. Thank you, uh, Chris. Uh, if you want to stop sharing. Okay, I'll do that. Well, uh, good. Um, anybody have any questions for uh, Chris? Uh, have to Ed? unmute yourselves. I muted everybody because there was so much background noise. So, Yeah, you'll have to unmute and then uh, use the little, um, uh, what the heck is it? Under, re is it reactions uh, to raise your hand uh, for questions? Flabbergasted everybody. <laughs> yeah. You did such a good job. I, I thought it was an excellent presentation. You covered it really well. Yeah. There were some very, very nice looking water effects there. Uh, well, we it says, and the rock, it works the same for the rock. You know, uh, it's whether you deal, it doesn't matter what you're painting, it's basically all the same technique. Mm -hmm. Has anybody tried it themselves out there? Yeah, I've tried, I've tried the, uh, the acrylic out. Yep. I've tried the, tried the acrylic and I've tried the uh, I've tried the acrylic paint over the uh, the tissue paper. Right. The glue that, that gives you that uneven. If you're looking for a, a smooth pond, it's not a good method to use. But if you want something that's typical of a harbor or, or the ocean or something like that, it's a good method to use. And mm -hmm. then you paint the top with acrylic. Yeah. Did you use the mediums to create the, the finish on the top? Pardon me? Did you use the mediums, or the acrylic yeah. mediums? Yeah. I used the acrylic to create the, the final finish after it was painted and, and everything was dried. That was the last step. Did you, uh, were you able to create the effects of the different shades of color uh, as you're approaching the shore? Yeah, I, I didn't play around with it too much. I used basic, basic acrylic colors that were uh, black, green, and, and some white, and some uh, blue. Yeah. And just, you know, freelance it. Yeah. It's not that hard, is it? No, no, it isn't. And it's, you know, it's a good way. It's tough to learn. I mean, if you're a perfectionist and you want exactly what it looks like in the picture, it'll take a little effort, and you'll have yeah. to put a lot of time into making it, you know, knowing how everything's going to go, because when you when you're brushing the toilet paper, it, it sometimes goes a different way than you want it to go. Yeah, yeah. But most of the time you clear it up. Well, that's a, yeah, I mean, really the toilet paper is giving you the shape, right? That's what, yeah. what it's doing. And, and you know, there's many ways to create shapes. You can use toilet paper. You can use, uh, you know, well, pretty much anything, you can, uh, sculpt a mold or whatever. Yep. And um, whatever's kind of rocks your boat and how you want to shape shape it. And once it's uh, sealed and, you know, with acrylic and and painted up, you can't tell the difference in terms of what's underneath. Not if you take time with it, most of the same methods uh, may be different, but you've got to take your time to get the results you want. Yeah. Did you practice before? I tried it a little bit. It was, it just seemed to be a simple methodology and it wasn't, it wasn't anything that, you can make a mistake and cover it up and not know you made a mistake. That's that was what that was yeah. the good part of it. You That's know, exactly you, it. Yeah. You're yeah. right there. It's not like you're trying to like sitting at an easel and you're trying to make a perfect painting or duplicate painting or something. Yeah. Um, you know, the, everything in the ocean is static isn't there's nothing in the ocean that's static anyway. So yeah. everything's always moving. Well, you it's the same even in rivers, right? You've got rocks yeah. and you've got 
logs and all kinds of stuff that gets in the way, uh, you know, yeah. and uh, things happen. There's speed of the water that creates all kinds of action. Uh, the reflections of what's on the shore, it, it really gives you a multitude of things to consider. Yeah. Anybody else? Give it a go there. Uh, they Nobody's tried it. Has anybody ever worked with water uh, on their layout? Paul Dexter? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I've, right, got, I've got Chris. Uh, great job. Uh, I've enjoyed your presentation. I've um I've got a uh, a dam that I've uh, that I have a pretty smooth um water uh, in yeah. back of. Yeah. And um I've used some uh some water texture. Um, it, it wasn't. It, it seemed to me, as I recall, it was. Um, uh, it was fairly viscous, but it wasn't terribly viscous. Right. Uh, and I'm. What I was going to want to do. What I want to do is to have a um um, uh, an outflow pipe. From yes. My, fill. my question, I guess, is that super viscous uh, material that you used. It, it, can you can you suspend that or do you have to I, I would apply it over some layers of uh, maybe thin strips of clear tape or something like that to paint up yeah. the tape the color you want your falls to be whether it's grayish white or off white um and then apply the uh the gloss uh, over it and kind of blobs and work it into shape the way you want it uh, let it pile up at the bottom. You can also tone this stuff too. So, for example, if it, it's coming out of there dirty, um, you, you you can add just a bit of color to it. You know, you might want to try a um, like a, a Naples yellow if you're looking for that brown look. But if you put too much in, it'll just look like mud. So you got to be very cautious. It's just a little touch. For that ten by ten piece, yeah, uh, thing, uh, the, for that for that ten by ten piece that you did, how what did you use? What a tablespoon of uh, of that material, or or a cup of it, or how much of it? Oh gosh, I don't know. I, I probably uh, hardly made a dent in it. Um, I would say probably in the jar, it might have taken a, an inch off of it. Okay, I mean, I was really focused in there. I mean, an HO scale, if that's what you're doing, you're not, you don't have these big waves. And if you are going to have them, you know, use some kind of molded material underneath, like uh, sculpt a mold to get the shape of the wave, and then just apply a little bit of this stuff on top and use the gel to create the splash or whatever it is that you're trying to create. Um, the thing is, is that you can water it down, too, because it's all water soluble. So if you want it to be less uh, gel like, you, know, you can do that. But you can also buy it in different viscosities uh, to help you along with that process. I mean, I've seen it applied with a sponge and that works really well if you just want slight ripples in the water. Um, you can just gently move that knife along to create ripplets. You, you can. It, again, it's it's you looking at the real thing and duplicating it with the tools at hand. The other thing I found was Woodland Scenics makes an adhesive. It comes in like a what I haven't got a Canadian. I haven't got it right here with me. But yep. um, we had a real fun. We had someone on real fun one night that demonstrated making waterfalls. Yeah. And. What he did was he took a piece of wax paper mm -hmm. spread it and out strips. on the table and then made streets, streaks like lines of this, uh, you know, of the adhesive. Yeah. When it dry of a night, when you pick the end of the adhesive, it picked up. But it was, but it did when it picked the wax paper, tipped off the wax paper, just the color on the back side of it. So when you applied it to a waterfall, it looked, you didn't have to go back through it and recolor it. Yeah. Most of the Woodland Scenics materials that you see there is just acrylic. It's repackaged and rebottled and charged 28 bucks a bottle rather than buying it in, yeah. in quantity right at the art supply store. So there's nothing wrong with those products. Just as well. you, but if you study their chemical makeup and then go after something that's uh, a little less expensive, you know, it's yeah. like using, using future floor wax instead of... Uh, uh, gloss mediums in your airbrush. You know, yep. It's the same idea. Get it in big bottles. But those jars, you know, they're in Canada, they run about 
oh, $25 Canadian, which is like, what, $18, $19 US. So yep. if you got your Michael's discount coupon when you buy it, you're probably looking at 40% uh, off of that. So that's really cheap. And it does go a long way. You can see in that uh, Trolls Kirk video how much he actually uses in O scale to do the area that he's working on. And you'll, and you'll get the idea that it's just applied very thin because you're it's it's the effect of the shiny gloss over a very, very thin application of what is a colored um, wave texture underneath that's created using other mediums. That video is very good. He, he spends a lot more time on um, uh, color, really. He spends a lot of time on, you know, the subject you're talking about, but he spends a lot of time on, on color, which is the most. Yeah, well, it's, isn't that key in terms of uh, what you're trying to create and where you're creating it? I mean, it's, yeah. that's, that's what we see is color. Um, and many times you've probably gone to shows and you've seen people do water and it looks too bright blue or it looks too something. It's because the water is basically maybe a, a color of paint blue that's been mixed with the medium and has been applied the same stuff everywhere. And it's very contrasty to what you actually see on the shore. It doesn't fit with, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's like putting a, uh, I don't know, state of Maine boxcar, uh, nice, bright, shiny, new on a, on a layout, you know it's going to stand out, right? But you have to do something with it to weather it to make it fit. All kinds of stuff out there. Yeah, yeah. Just and, and experiment with it. Yeah. Now, there's, I, I know that there's a couple people out there that are going to give it the old college try and James Wadley there you're in the process of doing a, a a water scene right so what since you're new at this in the context of actually using an application like this what are your thoughts your uh, positives and fears well one of the suggestions you made I've made a wharf for those who don't uh, know I've made a model of a typical maritime wharf which is about an actual 30 inches long. It's about half the size of what a prototype one would be, but you had suggested uh, painting the area and setting the wharf or, you know, bridge piers or whatever you have, boat models into the wet acrylic. The thing that I was thinking about as you were talking is the fact that if you were tired and you want to go to bed and resume the next day, I've got a lot of surface area to get ready to get this wharf put in. So I'm thinking of um, how can I kind of work up to it and then do the smaller area right at the wharf at the time I'm gonna place the wharf and, and make it look homogeneous. Yeah, well, is your wharf though, is it a see-through wharf or is it solid? It's solid, it's a rock yeah, crib so type wharf. That makes it a lot easier, doesn't it? You don't have to do anything underneath it, so you 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 don't really have to worry about that. You, I hope not. Yeah, I mean, you you don't even have to uh, glue it down or anything. You can you have a painted line on your layout there. Uh, just don't go over it or stay clear of it for a bit, and then once you do install your pier, you can uh, paint up to it and then add the medium on top and finish it off. I hope that's going to work out because there's over 700 pieces of strip wood in the wharf. <laughs> I've got about 80 or $90 worth of strip wood in it. Try a little piece on the little square. I, know. You I know? will. You I did take it. your advice. I made a little yeah. teeny tiny piece of wharf. There you go. <laughs> so that'll go on the little itty bitty practice square. Yeah. Yeah. That's terrific. So thank you for your help as well. Oh, you're welcome. I haven't got the bill yet, but <laughs> yeah. So, is there any? Uh, a lot of you guys probably have finished layouts, eh? Pretty much. What's a finished layout? There is. Well, such I mean thing. that that you've got all the you know basic waterways and formations of landscaping in place. Yeah, the basic all the basics are there. Yeah, I mean you can go back now. 
And if you want, you can use this stuff and, and create new things, or you can do it on dioramas. Right on top of what you already have. You won't even tell the difference, you know, other than it'll look look new and different, you know, in the context of your concept of the railroad. It's never too late to dig in and put a new waterway in. Rock formations are a lot of fun too. I I, I I didn't probably spend as much time on it, but there's so many nice carving tools and different types of materials you can use to create rock. Uh, but all in all, in the end, it comes down to the same kind of strategies for painting. Now that a lot, of, there's another technique I thought maybe I mentioned the sort of post is that people will start with uh, a light gray painted, spray painted on everything. That would be the rock work, the grass work, the sand, the water, all the same color, and then highlight it with a uh, buff, and then go in later and color it using glazing techniques where you're applying uh, light washes of the particular color you want to use, whether it's the the stone tones or the uh, um, or the sand color uh, and staining it over over top of that lighter color. Uh, it's a much more advanced technique. It's much more time consuming. Um, I know that uh, there are a lot of people in the uh, military modeling world uh, that do dioramas that that take that style approach. They even uh, stain and paint their uh, static grass that way to control the colors in the static grass. There you go. <laughs> I've, I've done that for years with uh, my grass, with the static grass I'm using here. Um, yeah. I must always go over it with an airbrush and, and bring my own colors into it. Perfect. There you go. Well, the paint manufacturers are making paints now that that are so they're heavy. They're real heavy texture, but they're all based on what the, the fine scale modelers do with uh, some of the uh, artillery, you know, in the uh, war in the war war genre. Yeah, uh, they use a lot of those thicker, uh, different colored paints that uh, that work well in, in uh, railroading, but they're not not designed for railroading, but they work well mm -hmm. in this hobby. Well, here's the challenge I put out to you is you take artist acrylic paint and make it work like model paint. Yep. Because if you look at the quality of pigment that's in artist colors, mm. it's just as good as it is in the finest model paints. It's a case of how you control the uh, medium portion that's added to the paint to make it less... Uh, opaque or, or more translucent, uh, more applicable. And, you know, we use all kinds of products like that anyway, even on our model paint, when you look at uh, creating uh, wet water and and uh, applying those um, stuff for the airbrush so it doesn't clog it up, you know, it's, just, it's all of those types of, of mediums. And hobby companies will charge you an arm and a leg for a little bottle, but if you go down to your hobby supply store there, your art supply store, You'll see those in great quantities, half liter bottles. It's all the same stuff because, you know, guess what? Artists use airbrushes. And what paint do they put through them? They put through uh, the uh, artist quality, high viscosity acrylic paint. Model Railroad Hobbyist has a very good, uh, in my opinion anyway, um, PDF document on uh, acrylics mm -hmm. and he goes into some great great detail about different acrylic paints has some formulas for thinners and yeah whatnot on them uh, it, you get it right on their website it's a free download it's very worthwhile if you're doing any work with acrylics yeah and again it's just a case of you know get a sample of something an old cheap kit or even a piece of plastic and uh, paint it up see what you can do Anybody else have any questions for uh, Chris? No? 
Okay. Well, thank okay. you very much, Chris. Really appreciate it. Yeah, no thank problem. You. Thank you. And you guys have a great weekend. Yeah, I thank think you. we're going to. It's, it's going to be pretty good once we get by tomorrow morning, I think. There you go. So, yep. Thank and, you, Chris. Uh, you guys from thank up you. in the uh, Eastern uh, Canada Division, it was good to see you all tonight. I saw some of you last night. Mm -hmm. uh, I joined their uh, meeting last night. And uh, what one of the things that we're trying to do is is do a little bit more of this inter, is that the right word, inter? Um, divisional meets where we can bring uh, people from other, other divisions in to, to uh, give us presentations that we might not otherwise get to see. So uh, it, it was very good tonight, Chris. Um, very interesting. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I know everybody else here did too. So thanks again. Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you, Chris. Well done, Chris. Thank you. Yep. Fantastic.